I'm going to put 2,000, let's call this, you know, 500, 500, 1,000, 1,500. Let's make this top spot here 2,000. It's almost like I planned the size of this graph so that it would fit appropriately. Now, if I make that 2,000 up there, right, I'm going to switch over to blue now. What you guys have told me is that the gradient of that graph above is 2,000 for that early portion of the graph, up to day 68 and then it stops, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna draw my gradient line here and it has a value of 2,000, indicating that for all those days from the start of my, uh, my graph there up to day 68, I'm increasing my number of new cases at a rate of 2,000 every single day, which, which is a lot, right? Okay, so at that point, I actually have to pause because looking back at the original graph, let's come back to that now, um, the gradient then changes, right? It starts to shallow out. Now again, I've put a grid here and hopefully the numbers can help you interpret what's going on here. As I go by day by day by day, the gradient now is a different number. Have a look from day 68 to 71 and beyond, what's the rate of change now? What's the gradient function's value going to be? Anyone want to throw in a comment? Aha, okay, very good. Mo gets in first, Yana, uh, a oh sorry, Lawrence, oh everyone's coming in now, okay this is great, alright, except Abby I think we threw an extra zero in there, I hope it doesn't get that bad, but I think I know what you meant. So yeah, there's a, there's a lower gradient of a thousand, so it's, it's actually half, right? Now what does that mean on the graph of the gradient function that we were doing down below? Well I'm not going to be at 2000 anymore, it just abruptly, in this model anyway, it abruptly drops down to 1000 and it continues. So let's go to our gradient graph over here, uh, it kind of has this break in time, like so, and um, 1000 is going to be here on my vertical scale. So from day 68 onwards, I'm going to have, let's go in blue now, I'm going to have a gradient of 1000. There we go. That's what the shape of the graph is. Now, this is a weird looking graph. Um, we call it uh, a step function because it looks like a set of steps, not that you need to know the technical name. But this thing's weird, it's, it's sort of broken into pieces, but we can still understand it. And importantly, we can still answer that original question from this different perspective of a derivative. And let me just repeat that again. We're gonna go back to this original question. What's the total number of new cases between days 67 and day 71? We can answer that same question on the basis of this new graph. Just imagine, just forget about that earlier graph that we did before. Suppose this was the only graph that was presented to you. How would you work out that same number? Well, if you wanna work out how many uh, new cases there have been over that time, um, you would do this in chunks, right? You'd say, well, from day 67 to day 68, that's this sort of time period here, there's a single day that passes, and during that day, 2,000 people are diagnosed. So let's do some working here. If I said the total number of new cases, I should say new cases, sorry. I said it, but I forgot to write it. The total number of new cases, well, for starters, there's going to be that one day where 2,000 people are diagnosed. That's from day 67 going over to day 68. But then there's this new part of it, right? As I go from day 68 to 71 across here, and then I stop there, sorry, my arrow's gone just slightly too far. Um, here I've got three days that pass, and then there's a new rate at which new cases are diagnosed. Three days, and each day, just like you told me, there's a thousand new cases diagnosed. So I'm going to add on to that one lot of 2,000, one day, with 2,000 cases per day. I'm now going to add on to that an extra three days, where I get 1,000 cases per day. I've still got the same units there. Uh, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and be lazy. Sorry, guys. Okay, there we go. So, I've got three days there at a slower rate. 
And so thankfully, hopefully things will improve from here. Now the numbers, again like before, are simple, right? One lot of 2,000 gives me 2,000, three lots of 1,000 give me 3,000. And much to our relief, this is exactly the same answer that we got before. In mathematics, if we approach a problem from a different way, we shouldn't expect to get a different answer. We should expect to confirm the previous answer that we got. Okay. Now, what does this tell us? What can we learn from looking at the same situation, total number of new cases between this particular time period, and looking at it from two different perspectives? Initially, we looked at it from a sort of total accumulative sense, and we did this subtraction. And then here, what we did was we had a look at it from the perspective of the derivative, from the perspective of the rate of change. Well, what this tells us is that really these two things are one and the same. If I only gave you this derivative graph, you could work it out by saying, oh, 1 times 2,000 actually represents, I'm going to draw a rectangle in here, this area up the top, right? That's the 1, which is the width, and the 2,000, which is the height. And then in addition to that, I also have this other guy over here, another rectangle, which is three wide and it's 1,000 tall. I'm calculating, like we looked at last lesson, the area under the curve. Now, in this case, the area under the curve is really easy to work with because they're nice regular shapes. They're rectangles, the easiest kind of shape to evaluate the area of. But often, in fact, for years now, we've been dealing with functions that don't have nice neat curves like this. They're all wiggly and wobbly and we don't have nice like length times breadth or um, base times height on two for those triangles we were having a look at last time. We've got really complicated shapes that we don't simply have a formula for. So in those cases, if I asked you for the area under the curve of a graph like that. How would we do that in the absence of an area formula like we learned in year 7 and 8? And the answer is by having a look at where we started. By going up, instead of going from this graph and then differentiating to go down, we know that the reverse of that process is what we call integration, right? Anti-differentiation, if you might remember, that's how we first introduced it. So if you've got this weird wobbly looking curve that it's difficult to work out the area of, you can't just break it into neat and easy rectangles like this, then instead of trying to break it into such areas, you integrate. That will take you to this curve and then you simply take the difference between one value and another. You will end up with this same solution. So, underneath where you've put those two graphs, let's try and capture what we've just said in some of the notation that we've already been using, okay? Underneath here, what does this tell us about the connections between everything? Well, I was interested, remember, in total change. That was the question I was asking about these COVID-19 cases. And we looked at it in two different ways. The first way was to say, well, just have a look at where you ended and subtract that from where you started. So if I have a think uh, over here, let's call this guy F of X, capital F, um, 11,000 and 6,000. Where did I get those numbers from? And the answer is I looked at the horizontal axis, I looked at the appropriate days, 67 and 71, and then I went up to the graph to see where that matched, right? In other words, that uh, 11,000 was really F of 71. One, that's where I got that value from. And the 6,000 was really F of 67. That's where I read it off of the graph. I got those vertical values. So now I can take that together and write, well, the first way that we calculated this was look at your state at the end and subtract that from your state at the beginning. You'll work out the difference and you'll get your answer, which we worked out was 5,000. But you can equivalently look at it from the perspective of a rate of change. That was the second graph. I'm going to use some colors here to help me. A rate of change. And then you multiply that by how much time you spend at that particular rate. So for example, we had uh, a rate of 2000 per day for one day and we multiplied that together. And we included that with a rate of change of 1000 per day for three days, and we did that over and over again. Now to say that, to say we, we do that over and over again for all the different parts of our graph, we use this notation that we introduced before, this elongated S, we're taking the sum of all of those different areas, in our case it was pretty easy, just two rectangles, from 67 to 71 of, number one, our function, which is the rate of change, that's why I'm using these two colors here to separate them, 
and then our time was on the horizontal axis, remember that? So the change in time, we would use the letter D to indicate change, like delta, and because it's on the horizontal axis, we would say, well, that's, that's an X value, right? So this is the familiar kind of notation that you've been seeing for a while in differential and integral calculus. Now, all of this is particular to this specific example, day 67, day 71, um, and those values of 11,000 and 6,000. But this whole idea of looking at a function, looking at its integral to working out to work out area, um, this is always true no matter what numbers you throw at it. And that's what the fundamental theorem of calculus I'm just going to write FTC because those words are too long for me to write. The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us this, right? If we want to work out the sum of all the areas from some starting point to some ending point, A and B, um, and we have some function, f of x, and we're having a look at it horizontally, okay? If we had nice, you know, straight lines, we could just go ahead and say, oh, that bit's a rectangle, that bit's a triangle, that bit's a trapezium, and then off we go. But in the vast majority of cases, where we don't have a nice, neat formula, we need to resort to calculus. You need to take this f of x, you need to anti-differentiate it, to integrate it, to go up to the function that it came from, and then subtract your endpoint from your start point. This guy here, if you want to, this is the kind of thing that you want to put a big box around. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus. So, this guy here, whoops, there we go. This guy here is what we're going to use in a sense, just like you learned how to do differentiation with first principles, right? This is kind of like your first principles for integration. This is going to be the thing we come back to over and over again to solve problems, um, just like first principles helped us get gradients.